Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you very much indeed for asking me to come along this evening and uh, talk about the Bloodhound Project, and in particular, uh, my role in the Bloodhound Project, which has been design and manufacture of the uh, hybrid rocket engine. I think the problems that uh, the electronics industry in the UK are facing are very much the ones that Bloodhound is trying to address, and we've heard that uh, illustrated uh, in the presentations earlier on today. First of all, I just want to say a little bit about my background. And it's not something that I usually uh, mention in, in Bloodhound presentations, but basically my company is the Falcon Project Limited, and this was started off as an amateur rocket project by my grandfather and I back in 1995 after a long-term interest in science, particularly chemistry, and in model rocketry. And we started off just flying model rockets, the kind of thing that you can get from the hobby store. And we launched several of these, became somewhat repetitive. We were doing experimentation, we were trying to the performance, but we decided we wanted to do something ourselves. So we built our own rocket, uh, which we call the Falcon, and we launched it from a local farm in 1995. It went to about 100 feet. The following year, we built a much lighter weight version, which is this rocket, uh, Falcon 6. And you see a picture of me there, age 12. We realized that we couldn't launch that from the local farm, so we asked the Army if they had a suitable location for us to fly it. And they asked us to go up to the Army ranges in Otterburn in Northumberland, and we launched it there with some, uh, with some press coverage, and it went to about 1,000 feet. Everybody thoroughly enjoyed it, and uh, they basically said, when are you coming back? What's next? And that rocket had six of the largest rocket motors that we could get hold of at the time in a single stage. And the following year, we returned with the next rocket, which had 32 rocket motors clustered in three stages. And we launched that in a howling gale uh, in, in February 1997. And as it broke the, uh, the hill line, we found a sh sheltered area on the range to launch it. It was seriously affected by the wind. It got to about 3,500 feet altitude, and the third sta it, it weathercocked, and the third stage fired just in time to send it down an awful lot quicker than it went up. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> the 14-foot rocket uh, went away in a, in a bin bag. But one of the things we took from that, firstly, you can't launch in those kind of weather conditions, but secondly, we realized that we couldn't just go on indefinitely clustering rocket motors together. So we approached industry to see if we could uh, get hold of a rocket motor, somewhat unsurprisingly, they didn't want to sell them to 13-year-olds uh, running amateur rocket programs. So we then started uh, to see whether or not we could do some of our own research, and we set up a site uh, in California where we could actually uh, make our own compositions, license facility, and start doing our own research out there. And what we actually did was we developed our uh, propellant technology, we manufactured our rocket motors, then we had to go through the whole administrative process to get them to the UK where we could launch them. But we took those up uh, to Otterburn in, uh, for two launches, uh, the first of which was in uh, May 1998. It was a complete failure because we couldn't get the, uh, the, the right kind of igniter for the rocket motor, and the thing just sat there burning somewhat embarrassingly on the launch pad for about 60 seconds uh, when the motor should have burnt out in three seconds and the thing should have been several miles up into the air. So uh, we returned... Uh, later that year, with the right uh, with the right igniter, and uh, launched that rocket, it got to just under our twenty thousand foot waiver, and uh, we w we wondered at that point what else we could do. But what we uh, what we decided to do is we decided to turn it from an amateur rocket program into a commercial rocket motor manufacturer. So we actually went into industry manufacturing solid propellant rocket motors, which is what Falcon uh, now does to this day uh, at sites in the US and the UK. And our customers are mainly, uh, mainly military, but commercial customers as well. So we manufacture solid propellant, uh, solid propellant rocket motors, and that's a static fire in at our uh, UK test site in Buckinghamshire. Now, hopefully that, uh, that provides some background I actually left school when I was 13 to run uh, the Falcon Project full time, so I didn't go through any of the academic process at all, really. And you might, make, you might think that that makes me uh, somewhat anti-academia, uh, but that's not the case. I think what's required is a good balance between practical industry experience and uh, academic expertise. So I think the whole learning process that I had was uh, from my grandfather, who was an engineer, just soaking up that knowledge from him, and also from talking to the leading people in the industry, people like Charles Martin, the chief engineer on uh, Blue Streak, or uh, Dr. Peter Penny, uh, one of the top uh, rocket ballisticians in the world, or John Scott Scott, who worked at the Rolls-Royce Rocket Department. I, I spoke to all these people and soaked up a massive amount of knowledge from them. So I think this whole idea of the apprenticeship and getting uh, young people to soak up that knowledge from the experienced uh, older generations in the workforce is very, very important to this. So Bloodhound came along 
uh, actually, yeah, I started looking at this in, in 2005, and the idea was that uh, the, s the current land speed record, uh, which was set uh, by Wing Commander Andy Green in Thrust SSC back in 1997, of 763 miles an hour, might actually be threatened by uh, other cars, other projects around the world. So Richard Noble, Ron Ayres, the aerodynamicist, and Andy Green all started looking at what a successor to Thrust SSC might be. And uh, they came to one conclusion fairly quickly that it couldn't be a pure jet, it was going to have to be uh, rocket powered. And th through many evolutions of the design, what they have come up with is, uh, is the Bloodhound. And this car actually has three engines. We have a jet engine from a Eurofighter Typhoon, which gives us 20,000 pounds of thrust on full afterburner. We have the largest hybrid rocket that's ever been produced in Europe, which gives us 27,500 pounds peak thrust, 25,000 pounds average thrust. And we actually have a Cosworth Formula One racing engine in there as well. It doesn't drive the wheels in any way. It purely exists to pump our oxidizer, hydrogen peroxide, into the rocket engine at a rate of one ton in uh, just over 20 seconds. So this is very, very complex by the standards of a land speed record vehicle, different engines, and the aerodynamics and the design to actually produce this vehicle to go at this speed on land is a huge technical challenge. Now, as uh, Stacy mentioned uh, earlier on there, Actually, setting the land speed record is third in our order of priorities. What we want to do is we want to create a national surge in interest in science and engineering. And this actually started early in the project when we had a meeting with Lord Drayson, who was then uh, Minister for Defence Procurement. And he said, we've got a real problem uh, within MOD and within UK industry. We just don't have enough young people with the right skills coming into engineering and science. And we then started to think about how we could address that because one of the points he made to us, he said, we never had this problem in the past when we had iconic projects like Concorde, like the Vulcan bomber, like TSR2, even Blue Streak, something that young people would look at and say, I would like to be an engineer, I'd like to be a test pilot, something that would inspire them. And we decided then that if we were going to go out and break the land speed record, that wasn't, that wasn't enough. What we needed to do was set a bold objective. We didn't say we were going to slightly raise it, we were going to go for a thousand miles an hour. And that really sets Bloodhound apart because it's not an engineering project in which you know the outcome of, of, of the project when you start and you know roughly how you're going to go about it. It makes it an engineering adventure because that region beyond 763 miles an hour is completely unknown. Even though uh, Thrust SSC set the first supersonic land speed record, Mach 1.02, we only just started to look at the, the region, the effects between the wheels and the ground. So there's a huge technical challenge there. And the answer is, we don't know. We've designed a car which we think is capable of 1,000 miles an hour, but we're not going to really understand those predictions until we get out there into the desert and test it. So where are we going to run this car? Uh, ideally, we'd like to go back to uh, Black Rock in Nevada, where the previous record was set. And unfortunately, it's not really rained properly out there since 1997. It's not renewed the desert surface and um, made it suitable for running a land speed record car. In fact, they actually have a... A uh, festival called the Burning Man, where basically uh, about 50,000 people drive out into the middle of the desert in their SUVs. It's ploughed up the surface, you've got terrible wind erosion, and it's more like driving across a ploughed field. The last thing you need at 1,000 miles an hour is a speed bump. So we had to start looking for some <laughs> other location. And we searched literally worldwide. The only place that we could find was called the Hackskeen Pan in the northern Cape of South Africa. And this track is actually shown here as 10 miles long. It's 10 miles with a mile overrun at each end. We now think we'll actually need the full 12 mile length of track. And this surface is unbelievably flat, but there were a couple of problems. One of which is the fact that there's a causeway going across the top of the track there. And the South African government, the Northern Cape government have been tremendously supportive of this. Uh, they actually said, well, we've got a uh, tarmac road going around the lake now, uh, so we'll remove that for you. So they actually took out that uh, causeway. There's another problem though. The entire surface of the desert was covered with tiny stones and even something about 10 millimeters in diameter, if a wheel hits that at 1,000 miles an hour, could potentially cause that wheel to disintegrate. So we've had to clear the entire desert surface, 24 million square meters cleared by hand. We've had a team of about 300 people out there for a couple of years, and they have finally finished it. But it's the equivalent of clearing a four-lane road from here to Moscow by hand. Now, earlier on uh, in the year, there's a couple of pictures on the right-hand side uh, taken when the lake was flooded. It's rained out there, it's drying out now. It should be the ideal land speed record track when we come to run out there in 2015. 
Uh, just to give you a quick uh, idea, this is, uh, some, these are some of the larger pieces of material that we had to remove from the desert surface. On the left-hand side is our track boss, Rudy Reich. In the middle, Wing Commander Andy Green, the driver. And on the right, uh, the Director of Public Works for the Northern Cape Government. I say they've, they've been tremendously supportive. But the thing that I want to show you here is that we surveyed a two-kilometer stretch of the track, and the variation in height was just 61 millimeters. This really is unbelievably fat, unbelievably flat desert, the ideal location to run a land speed record car. So I'd like to show you a quick video here of what we hope the car will look like when it runs across the desert in South Africa. <laughs> Bloodhound SSC, you're cleared. Engine start. Bloodhound engine start. Ready to roll. When we actually released that video, uh, we got a call from an American news network congratulating us on setting the 1,000 mile an hour record. <laughs> we uh, had to explain as uh, politely as possible that as good a piece of CGI as that is, that's all it was, and that the real thing was yet to come. So there's lots of high, there are lots of high technology programs out there. What makes Bloodhound unique? Well, you, if you take Formula One, for instance, all the technical detail about the cars has to be kept restricted because they want to maintain advantage over the, uh, over the other teams. If you take aerospace and, and uh, defense projects, again, reasons of national security mean that you can't share the technical detail. The thing the young people really want to get their teeth into with everybody. But Bloodhound is unique because we're able to share all the data from the design, the research, and critically from the running of the car with schools, colleges, and universities around the UK and around the world. And we want to extend this to the point where when we do a run, and w the engineers are in the desert looking at the data from that run, that is being made available live to all the schools that are following the project. So as we're finding out how the run went, what the wheel loads were like, what the vibration was, everybody can be following it and get as close to the project as possible. If you go onto the website now, you can actually download a full set of engineering drawings for the car. Uh, they're slightly out of date because the design is evolving, but we will be releasing another, another set fairly shortly. So we're making all that detail available to everybody that's following the program. Now, my involvement in the project is, is essentially all related to the rocket engine, because when we started the project, we had to consider what, uh, what kind of rocket engine we were going to use. And there are three main kinds of rockets, solid propellant rockets, liquid propellant rockets, and hybrids. Solid propellant rockets, this is what Falcon makes, 
Uh, you see on the right-hand side a picture of one of our static firings there. They're fantastic. They're simple. They're storable. They're very reliable. You can leave them for long periods of time, and when you press the button, they're ready to go. And they make, that's what makes them ideal for military applications for use in missiles, etc. But the downside of a solid propellant rocket is once you ignite it, it's basically a glorified firework. You cannot easily shut it down. Now, obviously, the technology is advanced from gunpowder in fireworks to advanced composite propellants, things that you'd find in the space shuttle, solid rocket boosters, for instance, where instead of using uh, potassium nitrate as the oxidizer, we're using things like ammonium perchlorate, fuels such as aluminium powders and rubbers. But being unable to shut it down is the key problem for a land speed record car. Now, th there are ways to do this. You can attach a, a flexible explosive charge around the nozzle, and uh, if Andy needed to shut it down, he could fire that, it would chop the nozzle off, immediately drop the chamber pressure, the nozzle would go flying off down the desert. We suggested that to Andy, and he raised his eyebrow and said, I think you'll have to come up with something a little bit better than that. So we then started looking at liquid propellant rockets, and this is the kind of thing that you'd find in a Saturn V in the space shuttle main engine where you have a liquid fuel and a liquid oxidizer stored in separate tanks. They're then pumped or expelled under gas pressure into a combustion chamber where they're atomized, mixed and burned. Now, the advantage is that you can get very high performance. You can control them, you can throttle them, you can switch them on or switch them off. The downside, principal downside, as you see in this supposedly simplified diagram, they're inherently complicated. Metering the flow of those two uh, propellants into the chamber, uh, cooling the chamber, this thing's operating, internal temperatures could be over 3,000 degrees Celsius, internal pressures over 3,000 PSI, huge technical challenges in design. So we also decided that uh, when you turn the liquid propellant rocket on its side, you get other problems with the combustion chamber. So if you imagine a, a vertically launched rocket, you let one of the propellants in a little too early or one a little too late, any excess can simply drain out the chamber. When you turn that on its side in a land speed record car, you then run the risk of them pooling in the chamber, you could get explosive mixtures. We decided that wasn't the solution for Bloodhound. So we then come to the third kind, hybrid rockets. Now, dependent on your viewpoint, these combine the advantages or the disadvantages of uh, solid and liquid propellant technology. And I'm not necessarily an advocate of hybrid rockets, but they are a really good fit for Bloodhound. Essentially, the term hybrid comes from the fact that it, you have elements of solid propellant technology. Your fuel is a solid form contained within the chamber and it will not burn on its own, unlike a solid propellant. It requires a separate source of oxygen. So the oxygen, uh, in the form of a liquid oxidizer, is supplied into the chamber, and the real advantage to this is you've got certainly half the complexity of a bipropellant system, but you can switch it off simply by turning off that uh, flow of oxidizer. So that really made the hybrid rocket the ideal choice for Bloodhound. Now, fundamentally, the hybrid rocket is very simple. You may have seen uh, the Mythbusters building their hybrid rockets with nitrous oxide, laughing gas, and uh, paraffin wax, or perhaps you saw Jem Stansfield on Bango's The Theory, he made a nitrous oxide hybrid using toffee as the fuel grain. But actually achieving performance that's comparable with a liquid or a solid propellant system requires a really detailed knowledge of the combustion process. In terms of the fuel, almost any combustible solid can be used. Wood, paper, paraffin wax, they've all been tried. I've even heard of somebody using ground up digestive biscuit as a fuel in a hybrid rocket. If it will burn, you can probably use it. But if you want to actually achieve, achieve reliable, uh, repeatable performance, you need a plastic like PVC or a synthetic rubber. The one that we've chosen for Bloodhound is a binder that we use in our solid propellant rockets, hydroxyl terminated polybutadiene, or HTPB for short. The next task for Bloodhound was really to look at the choice of rocket oxidizer with primary reference to safety. The downside is that all the rocket oxidizers are fairly unpleasant substances to deal with. If we have a quick look at a few of them, liquid oxygen, LOX, chemically obviously a very potent oxidizer. The downside is that as a cryogenic liquid at minus 183 degrees centigrade, it has to be stored in insulated tanks. It has a nasty habit of freezing up valves, particularly safety valves. Uh, so severe frostbite if it comes into contact with the skin, not really what we wanted for Bloodhound. You could then look at nitric acid, it's high density, it's a very good oxidizer, three main types, red fuming nitric acid, inhibited red fuming nitric acid, and white fuming nitric acid. Uh, white fuming nitric acid. You'll notice the recurrent element there is the fuming part. They all give off choking fumes, very, very corrosive, has to be stored in special, uh, specially conditioned tanks, again, not the ideal choice. Nitrogen tetroxide, N2O4, is used in uh, satellite uh, station keeping motors and launch vehicle upper stages. Like nitric acid, it's toxic, corrosive, carcinogenic. Again, not the sort of thing that we want for Bloodhound. We briefly looked at nitrous oxide. Um, as, as you know, it's used to boost the performance of automotive engines, considered to be a safe oxidizer. The amateur community use it as well. 
But uh, while we were actually designing a nitrous oxide hybrid, the team working on the hybrid for Spaceship Two for Richard Branson's um, civilian spaceflight vehicle had a very serious explosion in which sadly three people were killed. And this led us to look at the tendency of nitrous oxide to undergo thermal decomposition. We decided it wasn't the best choice for Bloodhound. We actually settled on high test peroxide or HTP. So basically HTP is water with an extra oxygen atom. It's H2O2. It's an aqueous solution, the concentration we're interested in about 87%. It's got a specific gravity of about 1.35. It's not toxic, but it is corrosive. And it actually has a, uh, an extensive history of use in the UK space program. Many of you may not even know the UK had a space program, but back in the 50s, 60s and 70s, a series of rockets were built, uh, the Blue Steel standoff bomb, Black Knight was a re-entry research vehicle, and Black Arrow placed the UK's only satellite into orbit in 1971. And they used HTP with kerosene as the fuel. Now, HTP has an interesting property. It can be decomposed into water and oxygen releasing heat, and if you do that in a rocket engine, it simplifies the process uh, quite substantially because you can just spray a fuel such as kerosene in and it will automatically ignite. The downside is that almost everything is a catalyst for HTP. So dust, common organic materials, various metals will all cause it to decompose. So if we were to spill some HTP onto the wooden floor here, it would start to decompose, generate enough heat to set the floor on fire. It would then burn fiercely in the oxygen that was uh, released. So very great care is required in handling this material. You have to wear special protective clothing, and you also have to ensure that you've got sufficient supplies of water on hand if you do have a spillage that you're able to dilute it. So the picture on the left there is uh, Black Arrow placing Prospero into orbit from Woomer in 1971, uh, making the UK the only country in the world ever to uh, develop a satellite launch vehicle and then abandon the capability. Apparently there wasn't perceived to be any economic future in the satellite launch industry. <laughs> and uh, sadly, a vehicle very similar to this would be uh, would be ideal today, launching a sort of 135 kilogram payload. On the right hand side, uh, you see the type of protective equipment that we require when we're handling HTP. So we decided we couldn't just charge straight in and develop the full size hybrid for Bloodhound. It was it was too significant a step. So we used one of our six inch 152 millimeter diameter solid propellant motors and repurposed it as a hybrid test bed. So a hydrogen peroxide enters the chamber, it passes over a catalyst pack which is a stack of 80 silver plated nickel gauzes, they decompose it into steam and oxygen, that enters the fuel grain, the synthetic rubber, at about 600 degrees, it automatically ignites, generates enormous volumes of hot gas which we then expand through a nozzle. Even this six inch chamber gives us about 3,000 pounds of thrust. Now. I mentioned earlier on the solids and the liquids, they're covered by fairly well known, fairly well understood uh, mathematical equations in terms of the combustion process that goes on. With a hybrid, it's really quite different. It's not fully understood, and let's just have a quick look at what's actually going on inside this hybrid combustion chamber. So we've got our motor case at the bottom here, we've got our fuel in the solid state, and we've got our oxidizer coming in from the left hand side, either as liquid streams of liquid oxygen or as fully turbulent hot gas from a catalyst pack. And there's actually a very narrow active combustion zone inside the chamber. That's then releasing heat into the fuel grain, uh, both by convection and gas phase radiative transport, raising the fuel into a vapor state, which is then trying to mix with the oxygen and generate that hot gas. Now, the problem with this is that if you change one variable, because it's a coupled process, you can have a huge effect on the overall system. So actually getting the design of this hybrid right w uh, was really critical. We started off with our catalyst pack, that's one of those silver plated nickel gauze discs. And this is our first attempt, we put a very smooth silver plate on there, we took that out to the desert and frankly it was a complete dud. What we actually got was a huge amount of wet steam, the fuel grain didn't even ignite, it was a complete failure. So we sought help from the electrochemist who worked on those catalyst packs in Black Knight and Black Arrow and he showed us how to increase the surface area of the silver, harden it and that was the Mark II disc that we produced. As soon as we put that into a rocket engine, the test program was well and truly underway. So that's the six firing of the six inch chamber. You can see now that the shock diamonds are starting to form in the exhaust, uh, clearly visible, usually a good indication that the thing's working well. In parallel to the, the practical R&D, we also set out to uh, make a computational model. We wanted to better understand those uh, processes. So we wanted to look at the local regression rate in particular along the fuel grain because hybrids have one particular problem. The conditions along the length of the chamber change quite considerably. So you've got the injection at the top, relatively low temperatures, six, 700 degrees Celsius, 
and then as you move along the length of the fuel grain, it gets hotter, the gas is moving faster, and you can imagine that if you simply have a, a monolithic fuel grain, it's going to burn at different rates. The model helps us to understand that, and this is a plot of the internal temperature. We could look at that for gas velocity, gas composition as well. And we tried something that was totally new in hybrids. We actually varied the composition of the fuel grain along the length to match the local dynamic conditions in the chamber, and that really helped boost performance. So that's the tenth firing of the, uh, 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 of the six inch chamber. We've actually done one firing since in the UK. We then had another problem, which is in order to generate that 25,000 pounds of thrust, we had to pump 105 pounds, or 47.6 kilograms of HTP, into the chamber every second. And for that, we turned to this rocket engine, which was the Stenter from the Blue Steel missile, and we actually found that they had a HTP pump in there that moved about 84 pounds a second. So, unfortunately, we couldn't get any technical drawings for this, but we were able to obtain a physical artifact from the Rolls-Royce Heritage Trust. We then set about reverse engineering it, respecifying it, uh, drawing it in CAD, and we were able, with the help of the original uh, designer, John Scott Scott, to actually improve the performance and produce the Bloodhound HTP pump, which is capable of, of pr providing that uh, flow rate. This spins at 10,000 RPM. It takes HTP from the tank in the vehicle at 24 PSI and feeds it to the uh, rocket engine at 1,100 PSI. It was actually the first manufactured part of the car. They're on display at the Farnborough Air Show in 2010. And to power it, we need about 800 horsepower. Now, in blue steel, this was done with a turbine, simply using HTP decomposers to drive a turbine at 50,000 RPM, gave about 1,000 horsepower. For Bloodhound, the problem with those turbines is that if you get the flow of HTP to the decomposers wrong, it can pick up speed at about 50,000 RPM per second. And if the turbine discs fail, uh, you have enough energy there to cut the car in half like a buzzsaw. Again, we're not operating outside the atmosphere. We've chosen a more earthbound power plant in the form of the Cosworth Formula One engine. It's a 2.4 litre V8. It spins at about 18,000 RPM. So we need a reduction box to drive the pump. Cosworth have been a big supporter of the program. And that engine, which weighs less than 100 kilos, gives us our 800 horsepower. The first thing that we actually tested was a thing called a monopropellant chamber. One of the other advantages of HTP is that you don't actually need combustion to generate thrust. You can just pass HTP over that catalyst pack, generate superheated steam and oxygen, expand that through a nozzle, and you can get about 10,000 pounds of thrust. Probably enough in conjunction with the EJ200 to get the car to about 800 miles an hour before we have to bring in the hybrid. Before we had access to our HTP pump and engine, we tested this in the US using nitrogen to pressurize a HTP tank. And when it's running, well, there's not really an awful lot to see. The decomposition's so clear that you can just about make out the heat haze. And were it not for the a quarter mile long dust cloud that we're kicking up just off camera and the thunderous noise, you wouldn't even know that the thing was running. We'll come back to the mono in a moment. The full size 18 inch hybrid chamber uh, was, a, was a technical challenge in itself. Uh, you see the, the picture that was taken there was at the launch event in 2008. And when we put the thing out originally, everybody said, mm, looks a bit tatty, it's just a stainless steel tube. So we mirror polished it. I didn't like it, it was a bit max power for my taste. And uh, however, the, the event, event went ahead, everybody took their pictures, etc. But as soon as, uh, as soon as that was finished, it went to the US, it was shot blasted, and we actually uh, filament wound uh, glass fiber over the outside of the case. That's what actually gives it its uh, capability to handle the internal pressure, which is about 800 PSI. So that's the finished full-size catalyst pack for the chamber. And we fired that uh, back in September 2009, and uh, pressure fed. And I'll show you a quick video of the first firing. Now note there's a monopropellant stage before the fuel grain ignites. When you realize that's at about one third of full power, you start to realize that Andy Green is a very brave chap indeed. <laughs> so 
bringing, uh, bringing you up to date, more up to date, uh, last year we actually did a series of monopropellant trials in the UK, and this was important because it was the first time we brought together the full system. All the individual bits had been tested in isolation, but we brought together the Cosworth engine, the HTP tank, the monopropellant chamber, and test fired it in uh, Buckinghamshire. And in our test cell, notice gone are the desert vistas. Uh, now that we're in rural Buckinghamshire, all this is conducted within a concrete bunker, and uh, that's to provide containment in the event of a problem. So we now have a HTP tank similar to the car setup, the HTP pump, the Cosworth engine, and some nitrogen cylinders there to keep the tank pressurized to about 24 psi. In another uh, building, we set up our control room so that the Cosworth technicians could monitor the engine, we could monitor the rocket, etc. And uh, here you see the HTP loading being carried out under the supervision of Chris Bucock, our safety director, and myself and uh, my colleague Lee Giles there uh, were actually loading the HTP from the individual containers into the run tank. When we actually fire the chamber, we literally point it out the door of the test cell. Concentration of the HTP had gone down a bit, so you can now actually see some detail in the plume. Now, most people thought this is just a jet of superheated steam and oxygen. We thought we'd considered all potential failure modes, a leak of HTP, failure of the chamber. But this is what happened on the second of those tests. You can hear the Cosworth engine running up in the background. was eight and a half tons of tarmac and basically what had happened was it was the hottest day of the year uh, in the air apron just outside the test cell there was a slight ridge the plume was fully attached to the uh, attached to the floor by the time it came to contact with that it just lifted slightly pulled a vacuum over that area of tarmac and lifted it off would anybody like to see that video again just the monopropellant chamber at about 10,000 pounds of thrust. You can imagine 27,500 pounds of thrust from the hybrid plus 20,000 pounds of thrust from the jet engine. So just to prove that there are no easy jobs in the Bloodhound project, this is our chief engineer, Mark Chapman, and I picking up some of the smaller chunks of uh, tarmac. We had to tidy that apron up ready for the next test, which we conducted later that day. This was all leading up to the main event, which was the first pump-fed hybrid firing. We couldn't do that at our Buckinghamshire site. We actually went to Newquay Airport, formerly RAF St. Morgan, and we used one of these hardened aircraft shelters. We actually had two in use, one to house the rocket and the other for the control room. Now, these were built for tornadoes, and they had at the back of each one of these a huge blast up with a set of steel doors. The idea was that the tornado could get the engine running inside the building before they pulled the main 70-ton doors back and let the thing roll out onto the runway. We set up our rocket pointing into the blast duct, and uh, we actually uh, were, were firing into a bifurcated duct, and it uh, emerged on either side of the building. So we fired that in uh, on the 3rd of October uh, last year, but Unlike most rocket programs, where you do all your development and testing in secret, and then when you're 90% sure that it's going to work, you finally invite everybody to see the final test, that's not what the Bloodhound program is about. We're about sharing the engineering adventure, sharing the technical challenge. So we invited 400 media sponsors, local school children, down to the very first test to see what was going to happen. We also streamed it live to over a million viewers uh, on the web, and we did not know what was going to happen when we pressed that button. It could have been uh, a complete failure, it could have failed to ignite, it could have exploded on the first test. But actually, as, th as, th as first test firings go, it went re really quite well. And we actually had uh, sc school children from a local school in the test cell talking to the rocket technicians, talking to the Cosworth technicians about an hour and a half before we started fueling this thing up. So that's how close people involved with this project can get to the technical detail. I'll show you a couple of videos. The sound may be a bit quiet because this was actually recorded in another hardened aircraft shelter about a thousand feet away. didn't go entirely to plan. Uh, one of the difficulties we had was uh, actually extinguishing the motor after the test. This is a four camera view. Note the thermal imager because the vibration in the test cell took it out fairly early into the test. So 
So that's hopefully brought you up to date and given you a flavour of the, the technical challenge for Bloodhound. I mentioned earlier on that we're trying to inspire that next generation, and uh, Stacey mentioned the uh, education programme. We actually have now a little bit more up to date than this, but actually have about five and a half thousand schools, colleges and universities signed up around the UK with the Bloodhound Education Programme. So it's a huge effort. Uh, and particularly importantly, we're getting through to the primary schools. And it's at that age that we feel we need to be getting the young people to consider what direction that they want to go in. But uh, as, um, as was mentioned earlier on in, uh, in the presentations earlier today, this is not just about the initiatives from government or the Bloodhound program. Industry's got to take its part as well because it's all very well to say, oh, well, we're not getting the, uh, the, the candidates in, the people aren't there. But uh, if industry actually liaises with the local schools and bring the children in, particularly from primary school level, to show them the opportunities that are there within industry and particularly stress to them what skill sets, what areas they need to be studying in order to get a job there, you're actually guaranteeing the future supply of, of, of key staff. And there are e excellent examples such as the MBDA program uh, at one of their sites in, uh, in Lost, they actually have 100% apprentice retention. And uh, we've also worked with them on their graduate and undergraduate programs. It's about continuing through academia, but as uh, Mr. Bode said, uh, superbly illustrated the point uh, earlier on, it's about being in partnership. So you already have a position, you already know where you're going, you already know what skill sets you need, and then using the academic process to supplement that. Just to give you an example of the kind of activities, they can be regular classroom activities, but they can also be things like uh, we did with the Heathland School, that's their rocket club. They've been running it for over a year. They wanted to break the record for the model rocket cars uh, set by the Joseph Lecky College at about, eight, uh, about 82 miles an hour. And these are for school constructed model rocket cars, launched down a, a steel cable, and it's official Guinness World Record. And they set out to break that 82 miles an hour. They actually had uh, the various cars running there. They took it to 129, then 149, and finally the black car there actually took it to 204 miles an hour. And there's a little bit of high-speed uh, footage here of it going through the timing gate uh, to set that 204 mile an hour record. And that project has just enthused the whole school. The whole school got behind the activity, and it just gives an example of what Bloodhound can do We've got a fantastic network of ambassadors, of which uh, Stacey is one, who can go out into the schools. Obviously, the team is very small, so we need those ambassadors, and I'd encourage all of you uh, who are here today to consider whether or not yourselves or your uh, staff might wish to become Bloodhound ambassadors and go to the website or talk to either Stacey or I. And uh, also, we've brought along a selection of uh, Bloodhound merchandise here. The uh, book is available. Also, we've signed up members for the 1K Club. So hopefully, that's given you an illustration of the technical challenge of Bloodhound, also how we're trying to address those same issues that have been mentioned earlier today. So with that, I'd like to thank you all very much indeed and invite any questions. Thank you. Well, we think it's going to take about 60 runs to get to, to full speed, and that's going to be done over two years. So what we've done is we've prepared uh, the desert surface so that we not only have the length, but we also have the width of track. Because, as you point out, it's not only the wheels, but the fact that that uh, supersonic shockwave coming off the front of the car actually compresses the air in the porous desert surface, and then as the car passes, that surface literally explodes up. So after the car's run over it supersonic, it's completely unusable for another run until such time as the desert floods. So what we'll do is we'll progressively move along our tracks during the course of the first year, let the desert flood again, and then come back uh, in the following year to take the record all the way to 1,000 miles an hour. He does not have an ejector seat. Uh, basically, we looked at this early on in the program, and the primary reason that you'd want to eject was if the car was starting to roll. Well, even with the response time of an ejector seat, if the thing had turned upside down, ejecting him may not necessarily increase his safety. <laughs> so the, 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 the other challenge is that most ejector seats are designed for operation at altitude, uh, and you wouldn't actually be able to eject at this speed, at low level, because the effect of the airflow uh, would, would effectively rip him to shreds. So you would have to eject in a capsule, and once you start trying to design that in the weight of the car goes up, you need a bigger jet, bigger rocket, etc. And we decided that just wasn't practical. So Andy uh, is sat in a safety cell, and our focus is on keeping him safe and attached to the vehicle as far as that's possible.
uh, hopefully, um, every, t every time that uh, desert surface floods, it will be improving. And as long as we've taken away, um, as long as we've taken away the, the stones and surface material, we've even got to sweep it for meteorites between the, uh, between the run. It's that critical. Some of the desert surface is softer. Some of it is harder. Depends on the underground condition. But we've seen it improve after each clean and flood session. So hopefully, it will just get better. Uh, one, of the, one of the great things about this is that uh, when we're designing rockets normally, we have to, um, you're trying to expand the gas out of the nozzle so that as far as possible it's correctly expanded at whatever the operating pressure is. Now, when you're flying vertically, that atmospheric pressure is changing, so you have to pick a point in the, um, I in the trajectory where you're getting the best return and design your nozzle accordingly. The great thing about this is because it's going across the ground, we can design it so that it's perfectly expanded uh, all the way through the run. So from a rocket perspective, it's actually it's actually quite good. The the challenges we thought would be things like the rocket digging up the desert surface behind the car, etc. But by the time you bring the rocket in, the car's already going at about 300 miles an hour. So it doesn't actually see much exposure to the desert surface for very long at all. So a lot of the issues that we thought we'd have with operating that rocket seem to be uh, seem to be diminishing as we as we go forward. But Putting a rocket which is running internal temperatures 2,800 degrees C, high pressure at the edge of its material limits into any kind of manned vehicle is a real challenge, especially on a, a program which requires it to be done as quickly and as on as low a budget as, as Bloodhound. Daniel is a businessman. He's running a business, three or four million pound turnover. I can't remember three or four million dollars turnover, but he has invested over a million pound of his own money into this project for no financial gain. And his motivation is about educating the young people, bringing them into industry. Also, what I would say is, he doesn't even have a driving licence. <laughs> I mean, it, it is a remarkable story. I hope you've all been enthused by him, and, and, um, and you know, it is a fantastic project. And I think that Daniel said earlier on in the presentation, the, uh, the thousand mile an hour isn't the be all end all. If that car does 990 miles an hour, it's still a success story for all those kids that have particip participated in this. I've been to some Bloodhound events. It is amazing seeing these children building plasticine cars, model cars. Um, it is, uh, uh, honestly, it is a success story, even if it doesn't even run now. It really is a success story. <laughs>